Welcome to the Hockey Writers Prospect Corner, a show with our top prospects writing crew, bringing you the latest news, analysis, scouting reports, mocks, rankings, and much more. From the world juniors to the NHL draft floor, from the farm to the NHL, our team covers everything that happens in the world of prospects. So sit back, grab a notebook, and get ready for Prospect Corner. Prospect Corner. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Prospect Corner presented by the Hockey Writers. In today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at the 2023 NHL Draft Combine, which just wrapped up this last weekend. I'm your host, Logan Horn, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-hosts and fellow prospect analysts, analysts, Matthew Zator and Peter Barracchini. Today, we are also joined by Matt Scheig, one of our Col- Matt Mark Scheig, my apologies, <laughs> uh, one of our Columbus Blue Jackets writers who attends this event every year, provides some really great coverage of it. We brought Mark on today to uh, provide a little color here. Uh, so, welcome to the show, Mark. How are you doing? Oh well, thank you. I, I'm I'm good. I'm used to having the last name butchered, but not quite the first name. So this, this is a good way good way yeah, to start. I'm just evening I'm, it out for you. That's it. <laughs> No, it's really good to join you guys for sure. Mark's a really tough name to mess up, but I managed to do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we're happy to have you. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, Peter, you also attended the draft combine. So uh, we're looking forward to some of your, your input here as well. Yes. Uh, how are you doing? How was your weekend? Oh, uh, good. Exciting and busy with the combine. Um, you know, obviously a little bit fatigued with the ride there and back, but no worse for wear. And always it was a pleasure, you know, attending the event once again with Mark as well as Jim and Andrew Forbes as well. So mm-hmm. the fact that the whole, uh, uh, you know, members of the THW crew were there in person, no masks, no nothing was a really great experience. Yeah, a whole crew went out. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Matt, you, like me, were just kind of attending the Combine through uh, Mark and Peter's uh, Twitter <laughs> timelines. So uh, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah, I was following along all uh, you know, the, through the days there. So uh, great coverage by both you and Andrew yeah. and uh, Jim as well. He, he did a great job. A couple articles out as well for him. Um, yeah, but... You know, the Combine's uh, very interesting. Some of the stuff that came out, we'll talk about it. So uh, yeah, very excited to to talk about the Combine. Yeah, absolutely. There's always um, some really interesting stuff that comes from this and stuff that kind of trickles out uh, from here until the draft day. Um, so for those who don't know, the Draft Combine is kind of a combination of some physical fitness testing. Um, but the most important thing from my perspective is teams, NHL teams, their upper management and their their scouting staff uh, get the chance to interview prospects. The top guys are all all there, um, so it's a chance to get to know them, kind of understand if it might be a might be a good fit. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to look at this. Some people have different emphasis. Some people value the fitness testing a little more, or something like that. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you, Mark, as our guest here, first off, uh, what your thoughts are on the draft combine as a whole? I know you cover it pretty regularly. Um, what value do you think it provides NHL teams as well as fans at home? Like basically, why should people care about the draft combine? A great question, because, it you know, it feels repetitive because the, the things that you said, it just t- um, prospects talking to teams as well as the fitness testing. So it definitely benefits teams. I mean, teams pretty much know these players already. You know, they scout them all year. They talk to them throughout the year, but it gets them in a more of a little bit of a casual setting where they can just talk to them one-on-one. I know some teams took some of the prospects out to dinner. So it's just, it's an opportunity for them, especially if you're a team that has a major decision at the top of the draft, Mm -hmm. kind of confirm what you believe and then ultimately make a decision. But, I think an interesting thing that comes from the combine that a team brought up, I think is really good, is it provides a baseline when it comes to the fitness testing. And then so Mm -hmm. what they'll do in the future then is they can look back at the combine and then they can look back at the progression that these teams, Mm -hmm. that the player is going through and they can see, are they on pace to kind of reach their potential fitness wise? And yeah. this, per- this um, management person that we spoke to indicated that there was someone on his team that was actually behind. So it actually gives them this more information within their profile. Mm-hmm. And then they can go to them and say, you know, what's going on here? You know, why, why do you feel like that you're not further along than you are? 
Um, so it's just, it's just it's information for teams, especially when you have an important decision to make ultimately. And then for fans, it's about you know who did these prospects talk to? Why might teams be interested in them? So it just gives us a little bit of an insight as to how the draft might start to play out because we start to hear a lot of the buzz, a lot of the possible news that comes out of it. So it might look boring on the un- on the outside, but trust me, it is not boring on the inside. There's a lot of information that goes flying at the combo. Yeah, there's a ton going on. Like like scrolling through again your Twitter feed from that day from that would have been on Saturday, right? Was that the majority of the stuff going on? That right, all yeah, interviews? a little bit Friday, mostly Saturday. Correct. Just like it's like, oh, this player, you're at an interview for them. Oh, another <laughs> prospect, another one, another one. It's like that that must be just like little overload there, but listen, it's hectic. Peter can hold, attest hold to tight. it. Because <laughs> they, they bring the while there's testing going on, they bring these prospects out one at a time and they're scrums. And you're literally jumping scrum to scrum to scrum. And then yeah. there's me who's trying to manually record all the heights and weights on top of that. So if it's the best workout of the year for me, by a long shot. <laughs> nice. Well, get some rest now before the draft day, I guess. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> Uh, I, that's really interesting. The idea of, of using the, the fitness testing as a baseline, but it makes a lot of sense when you have guys like, like a Ryan Leonard, who's pretty physically developed at this point, maybe not physically developed. He's really fit though. He's in very good shape. Um, and it shows, and he's going to get stronger, but not by a ton. It's not like he, he's pretty close to his current, like fitness max. It feels like, but then you have a guy like Gabe Perot who, maybe not entirely on the opposite end of the spectrum, but certainly has room to grow there. And that's, that's a really interesting way to uh, way to use this week um, to your advantage as a team to just track progress, I I suppose. Um, Peter, what are your thoughts on the, uh, the combine as a whole? Uh, You're, you're there to experience it. What, what do you think uh, teams value about this? What do you think fans can take away? What, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, uh, obviously, Mark touched on everything about, you know, the testing being a baseline. But for me, it's, you know, the personality of the players afterwards, you know, getting the sense of where they are in terms of, you know, attitude, mindset and everything like that. Are they outgoing? Are they a little bit more, you know, kind of reserved, kind of shy kind of thing? Um, A lot of but then again, a lot of the prospects that we were able to talk to, they were very open, very I, I guess I, at certain points, some of them did seem kind of reserved, but I think it was just maybe a little bit too much of them to take in at this point, as it is sometimes with a lot of the prospects, especially if there's, you know, you're not used to a massive scrum around them. But um, yeah, I, I think overall it, it, it's, it serves as a really good indication of what teams need to look for. You know, are they able to handle themselves in these kind of situations? Are they able to handle the physical strain in terms of testing, uh, uh, agility, strength, all of that? It, it all combines into one. And I can understand why, you know, it, it's not just one aspect that should override one another, but it, it's a good balance to get a read on where prospects are. And I think that this was, you know, once again, another great indicator of that. Um you know, obviously there are some prospects that I talked to that I was very high on that they were very open and, you know, very um, in tune with how to approach themselves as, you know, players in regards to the media and and engaging with them and, you know, even talking to the staff on to basically present themselves. And, you know, Ethan Gauthier had a perfect, perfect comment about the whole entire experience because, you know, his dad obviously is an NHL and he got advice from him and, you know, I asked him, you know, what did you learn from him? And basically he said to just be yourself, you know, that's all NHL teams want you to be is, you know, want you to be some someone different. They want to see you for who you are. And I think that was very important and very telling because they're basically showing that, you know, this is why you should draft me kind of thing. And it was very, I, I, again, I kind of repeated myself. It's very telling in that regard, but yeah, I, I, I think, I think the whole weekend itself is, to get these players ready for the next level. Um, and it, it, it is a good indicator for that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it feels like a lot of the questions and the interviews with media and with teams mm-hmm. is kind of just, just gauging um, how self-aware these players are because they're young. Not everyone is particularly self-aware at that age. Yeah. Um, 17, 18 years old to be able to um, confidently and, accurately talk about how you play hockey and how you think about it um 
in a mature way <laughs> and in a somewhat intellectual way like that's that is not normal so a lot of these guys have been training for this kind of thing for a long time they've been they've been growing up preparing for this kind of process but um that that feels like a, a major piece of it um on the the personality size Side. It really is. Uh, and I, just one more thing, obviously, you yeah. know, I, I really like to ask the questions about, you know, especially other players there when they play against one another, like, what do you think mm-hmm. of this person, uh, this player? How is this kind of accurate? But also like, you know, the laid back questions, you know, it, they, you want to get them comfortable that, you know, they're not just an athlete. They do they, like, you know, they're everyday human beings as well. So to get that personal side, to get those, you know, uh, I believe there were like also questions about like, you know, what type of a animal are you are? Uh, I know the Montreal Canadiens have asked that very consistently and every single player had a very different response and they gave an explanation for that because it is a good indicator on how they evaluate themselves as well. So to have that laid back kind of mentality as well is, is very good. Absolutely. Yeah, that that question made me laugh a little bit. There's always weird questions. We'll get to that. I promise. <laughs> yeah. There's always weird questions. And I'm sure you guys have a couple that, that I won't be bringing up here, but uh, I'm just gonna move on to the next question here. I'm going to, uh, so obviously the testing, the physical fitness testing, um, is always a really interesting thing. Um, but the, the media process is a ton of fun. Like you mentioned, Peter, getting, getting a chance to, uh, get in the personality a little bit, like you might've seen on Twitter, um, an interview with Will Smith where he's being like quizzed on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme song, <laughs> like to see if he knows the lyrics and he knows them all. Cause like, of course people have talked to him about that for like his entire life. Mm-hmm. Uh, poor kid. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, uh, Mark, I'll come to you first. Um, who are some prospects that stood out to you um, at the combine just in general, like either through the interview process Maybe some of the fitness testing. Who's who's some guys that that stood out? I'll give five and be quick, kind of quick hit fashion with yeah, this. So for sure. this guy named Connor Bedard that you all <laughs> may have heard of. And I'm bringing up the top prospect because he Ooh. acted the part. He gets all the credit in the world for what he does on the ice, but the way he handles himself, the way he handles the media, you're talking about literally the weight of the world on your shoulders from a very young age. And he plays the part. Like it's really mm-hmm. actually impressive to see mm-hmm. in person. Like I actually threw a kind of fun question at him, end up being a two-parter, where you know his buddy Kent Johnson on the Blue Jackets, their best friends, they play um, on the same team when an inline team with him and Andrew Cristal mm-hmm. as well. While Bedard was at the combine, their team lost 15 to 14, where Kent Johnson had 11 points. And so I quit Bedard and said. Uh, Only 11? What, what advice would you give him, Dave Ken Johnson, for, you know, next time make sure he doesn't lose? And he kind of, he laughed at the question because you know, I think he realized it was a little bit fun. It's like, well, get 12 or 13 next time, I guess, was his answer. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, just you can tell that he, he's really crafted for that sort of stuff, too. And then oh, man. Um, I asked him about his bond with Johnson. He actually admitted Johnson's been a big help for him, like helping him get ready for what's to come. So he's really leaning into that friendship. And then he had all the time in the world to talk about Andrew Cristal and just, he called him the smartest player that he's ever seen and the, uh, the way that he can create offense. So when someone like that speaks, mm-hmm. that, ha- that carries some weight. And it makes me think about how I look at Andrew Cristal. Mm-hmm. Now going back to the standouts. So real quick, outside of Bedard, Oliver Moore absolutely killed it with the fitness testing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you a little preview. My steal of the draft that I like to write in June, it's going to be Oliver Moore because I believe that he's going to finish as a top five player. And I think that he'll go slightly outside the top. Is all the, You know where all the attention has gone. Yeah. I think Oliver Moore has the opportunity to be a top five player by the time things are said. And he's got all the attributes. The fitness testing really, really stood out for me. Nick Lardis, somebody else that really did well with the fitness testing that – it's been on a heater ever since the trade in, um, in the OHL has had a chance with Hamilton to really show what he can do. And then a couple other names, Colby Barlow really did well with the fitness testing as well. And then a power, the teams love power forwards and um, usually you can get them middle to late first round. Charlie Strammel is somebody that is a name that you're really going to want to watch because he did so well with the fitness testing. So there's five names for you to consider, but that, that actually might help boost some of their draft stock because they really did well in Buffalo this week. Yeah, absolutely. There's always some guys that 
that do that. And it's, it's fun to, uh, to look at some of the like specific metrics that the NHL uses to measure them by and be like, Hmm, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. kilojoules per kilogram of body weight. <laughs> That's the exact same way I measure my bench press. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I know that they have like sports scientists for every team that are like oh that's great and they know exactly what it means uh but it means nothing to me sometimes which is kind of funny so it helps to kind of see them ranked out (laughs) um matt i'll come to you here next um who are some players uh sorting through videos and and quotes and numbers and stuff people that uh stood out to you during the interview process or some of the fitness tests uh what are your thoughts there yeah first of all i'm glad that that charlie stromel i stood out because I've been talking about him being in the first round. Everyone's talking about in the second round. I can see him jumping into the first round. So I'm glad that he's one of the names being uh, talked about after the combine. Uh, another one that kind of stood out just from Dan Marr saying about Etienne Moran being a guy that he'd take over every other defenseman. He'd take him first and he's ranked second round. Uh, a lot of the places have him in the second round. That would mean he'd be a first round pick uh, because we all know, Axel Sandin Pelica, David Reinbach are the two guys that everyone talks about as being the top two defensemen. And then Marr throws out uh, <laughs> Etienne Moran. And that was one that really kind of floored me. I'm like, wow, that's a guy that, I mean, this is the one of the bigger guys at Henshaw Central Scouting saying this. I think that carries a lot of weight. Yeah, so I mean, on. just just one second. I will clarify that I saw that same thing. Um, I saw he clarified that he was talking about just the North American defenders. Just the North American, okay. Which mm-hmm. still is like pretty big. A, it's a pretty big, pretty strong statement because you're picking him over Oliver Bonk, over Dragasevich, Molendijk. Like there's there's a good handful of guys that are probably going to go in the late first round. Yeah, and and he. He personally likes Moran the most. <laughs> yeah. So, you, you okay. I didn't see that yeah. clarification. So it's not maybe as big of a thing, but the first one I saw still big was yeah. <laughs> it sounded like he was saying them all, but uh, yeah, that so Moran's a guy I kind of looked more into and he, he is an impressive defenseman. So, I mean, could definitely maybe go in the first round, um, but there's just so many players there. And uh, yeah, but th- that's the one that really stood out. There's always a guy that kind of comes out, as being an interesting pick by some of the, some of the talk after the uh, combine. So um, yeah. It, and it, it's great to see Connor Bedard being at the top of a lot of the fitness tests and what, what was he at the highest of the pull-ups at one point there? I don't know if he finished. Did he finish with the highest? No, for someone that got to 15, so it I wasn't the largest past him. Nick Lardis yeah, got Lardis 15, yeah. passed. That's why I mentioned Lardis because he would not only there, but in a lot the of beast. other categories, he was a, he was a beast, <laughs> but Bedard getting thirteen—that's pretty good uh, for for. Uh, I mean, he is the top prospect, so um, yeah. So yeah, that's basically the guys that I kind of saw. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's so many guys we can talk about like half the draft class. It feels like at this point, but but it's just a it's a great event. Um, Peter, what are your thoughts? Interview process, fitness tests. Who who are some guys that impressed you? Uh, I'm going to start with the fitness first, and I'm glad uh, Mark brought up Nick Lardis because I was going to say him anyways, uh, <laughs> because of everything that he was able to do. He is in a lot of the categories, especially the um, agility, like, you know, the horizontal jump agility, everything like that. But um, Jaden Perron, I want to give a big shout out to because he was in quite a bit of those lists as well. Um, obviously I've been high on him, even though he's a smaller player, the speed that he has, the agility is, you know, you see it on the ice and it kind of matches that what you see off the ice. So I'm really glad that he was able to be, he wasn't at the top, but he was within that 25 top 25 range, which is a really good sign that he's able to showcase that off the ice. But the big one for me, and, and this is where it gets really interesting because you see how he plays on the ice and you know, it's not that great, but Cameron Allen was mm-hmm. in quite like a lot a lot of them were in the top five top 10 of the categories and it's really interesting because you see that he has a strength the agility that he has off the ice but on the ice you just don't see that same you know transition or same transferring of the skills off the ice on the ice and the only time you are you ever saw like a complete effort from him was just at the Helenka Gretzky Cup, and then throughout the year it kind of just faded away. 
So I'm wondering if a team is really going to be sold on his strength and you could work out the on ice efficiencies and take him higher than where he can go, where a lot of people have him as a late second, early third, as a result of his on ice play and impact. But with that strength, it, there's probably going to be a team that's going to say, you know what, Cameron Allen, we see you as a first rounder. And he, he was at the start. Mm-hmm. So big shout out to him for, you know, showing the strength that he has off the ice. I'm gr- I am glad you brought him up because I actually got to talk to him in the interview process and he gave me a money quote about <laughs> his season. He really opened up about his struggles in Guelph as a team and individually. Mm-hmm. And that piece is actually going to come out Monday when I empty the notebook, but we'll, we'll talk about it here real quick with him where he yeah. admitted that he's still trying to adjust his game. He wants to adjust his game to the point where it's more translatable to the NHL. He already knows that. And the fact that he admitted that to me was pretty striking. Mm -hmm. That he he knows that there's work ahead and he's willing to adjust his game so that it could be more translatable to the NHL. And I think that's a huge thing. And when a prospect knows that, like I'll throw out David Savard real quick. He was an offensive defenseman in junior. And you think of David Savard, now he's not that he's the heavy place to fit mm-hmm. his willingness to change the way he played mm-hmm. led to a longer career and i personally think that cam allen could be on the same path as david savard in that sense looking forward to that piece and yeah that's yeah, uh, yeah, really the fact that he's already you know looking ahead is a really great sign and you know what from our perspective we just see the on ice impact or what we see and it's you know He's cheating a little bit. He's getting out of position. And I think that you, you're starting to see that adjustment period. And maybe he's trying to do a bit too much, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what he has to say. Yeah, I appreciate what you guys have there on, on Cam Allen. That that's some some good details there, Mark. I'm excited to read about that. I he he's been a fascinating prospect to watch all year. Um like last season, he just and into the summer with the Holinka Holinka Gretzky Cup. Um he just felt like a top D prospect. Like he, he moved the puck really well. He skated well. He made smart, simple decisions really often. And then the season started and that all kind of fell away. And I don't think a player can just forget how to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what else has been going on in there, but Mm -hmm. he certainly did himself some favors at the combine. Hopefully he did the same in the interview process. And I'll add one more thing about the interview process with Cam Allen around 20 teams spoke to him. So there's a lot of interest still. Definitely interest. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot Uh, of sense. Before I we like yeah. we go out, get on anything, I didn't mention my interviews as well. I was so hmm. focused on the testing and uh, the way that Cameron Allen just stood out. Um, in terms of the interviews, uh, I just want to say that Andrew Crystal was probably the most open book kind of player that there was because he was, you know, cracking a smile every now and then, talking about Bedard, talking about everything. Like he's very personable or has that personality, which is really great. Um, I want to say that it, I really enjoyed talking to Scott Rasloff about the fact that how, you know, taking over the Thunderbirds goal when Thomas Millich goes over for the World Juniors, he has someone to go through that draft process with because Millich has already been through it and he can ask questions. So he was really happy to be a part of this process with him and go through go through it together. And I am going to also say Braden Yeager. Braden Yeager had a really great crowd and this was happening around the same time as Bedard too. And Yeager had just a big crowd as well, which is very interesting. Um, I really thought that, you know, again, very open, very telling of uh, where his game is at right now. There were a lot of questions about the goals dipped, but he wanted that he's been always trying to impact and be that out of play making element to it, which is what I've noticed all season. And you started to see that a little bit more. So he's becoming a little bit more versatile, not a one trick pony, not just a goal scorer, but this is a guy that can impact all facets of the game, facets of the game. And I really enjoyed it being in that scrum with him. So that was a, that was probably one of my favorite interviews and an honorable mention of Denver Barkey as well. Nice. Awesome. I'm just going to quickly mention a couple I was impressed with, and then we're going to move on to the second half of the show here. Uh, just a few fitness testing um, results that I kind of thought were interesting. Bradley Nadeau was really impressive to me. Um, I hope he's going to be on a few more people's radar soon. Uh, I know he's on NHL radar, so it doesn't really matter. Samuel Honzik and Nate Danielson also uh, performed pretty well at the fitness testing. Kind of makes sense. Bigger bodies, a little bit on the older side, so they're kind of they've had more time to physically mature. 
Um, and then someone on the interview side, I wasn't there to do interviews, but I've been listening to all these clips I can find and everything. Um, the Athletic, Corey Pronman and Max Boltman interviewed a few players, um, but the one I'm going to mention is Tom Volander. Um, I was thoroughly impressed with him in that interview. Um, partially, he just had like really good English, which was mm-hmm. impressive. Um, he's, he's doing the NCAA route instead of playing in the SHL next year, and they asked him about that. And just his self-awareness of um, how tough it can be for young players to get serious ice time and serious um, developmental focus from SHL clubs, it can be difficult sometimes. So he decided it's it's a better fit to come to North America and and play top four minutes immediately, um, maybe more than top four minutes, mm-hmm. probably more than top four minutes. Um, but he, he was very impressive. Um, just handled it like a real pro kind of reminded me of back in the day, Gabriel Landeskog um, just mm-hmm. coming over from Europe, but just being like polished and and ready to go. Like, it feels like he could, he could handle himself maturity wise and media wise in pro hockey right now, if he wanted to in North America, but I was pretty impressed by that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting that you brought up Volander because he did say like, we talk about, you know, Cameron Allen, being aware of his game right now. Volander is, is definitely one of those player, players that, you know, there he knows that, you know, offensively he doesn't, he would like to have a little bit more of an off, offensive impact, but he's very telling of his defensive game and his defensive structure and his ability to read plays. And that is something that, you know, you, you like Allen, you're seeing that willingness to say, yeah, there are deficiencies in my game, but you're still working towards it. So I agree that Will, Volander was a good interview. Nice. Awesome. Okay. I'm just going to quickly do uh, a couple quick fire questions that I just want to surprise you guys with. As you guys kind of brought up before, we always hear really weird, fun uh, questions that teams ask players. And I'm sure there's plenty of these um, that didn't get shared or some that I just didn't hear. I just have two of them here that I want to ask you guys. Um, first one is what animal are you that some places I saw people said it was like on and off the ice. I don't really care. I just want on the <laughs> ice. I know none of us are professional hockey players. None of us are trying to be professional hockey players, but I want to know what animal you're like on the ice. For me, it is, oh boy, I, I'm thinking like a panda. Like, you know, when a panda's like in a tree and you're like, that's where you are designed to be. You're just designed to live in a tree. And they always like fall out and stumble everywhere. That's me. Because <laughs> I'm I'm Canadian, I'm designed to be on the ice, but I'm horrible at it. So that's that's me. I'm a panda on the ice. Uh, Peter, I'm going to come to you next. What animal are you like on the ice? Oh God. <laughs> um, tough one. You're probably it's really. This is really, one this of the tougher really questions tough I've ever have asked. To come back to me on that one. I, I got I got to think that one through. Okay, Matt. What animal are you on the ice? Well, I haven't skated in like since I was five, so I, I'd probably be like a panda too, just flying around, not, not just falling over all the time. All right, all right, we got two pandas already. Uh, Mark, how about you? What do you? What animal are you on the ice? You think? I would say a wolf, um, just because nice. they travel in packs, and you know, I, I haven't skated in a while, but when I did, I was not a bad skater, not the best skater by any stretch, but could sure. do it enough and. Yeah, just I think the mentality out there, like my kind of backyard and stuff. I, yeah, I was just ultra competitive, and I feel like that that's that would describe a wolf pretty well. Pretty ultra competitive, <laughs> travel and pack. So that's what I would say. It's a good one. I like that, Peter. Was that enough time for you to come up with something? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, 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 it's probably not the best one, but it's one that I could think of on the spot. I'm going to say a hyena because Ooh, uh, every, si- every yes. single time, because every single time somebody would chirp me or do anything, I would just laugh back in their face and just, <laughs> just be annoying. That's a, great, that's just a good be one. annoying back to them. And even, to, even one point, I remember something that happened during a game where, you know, I'm battling for the puck. I, I lift the guy's stick. I regain it. He comes back. He cross checks me in the back. He gets sent off, and I'm there just laughing and waving. Bye bye. So I'm uh, I'm gonna say hyena, be, hyena, because I could be a bit of a troll. Nice. <laughs> that's a great one. The the laughing right back at them. That's that's perfect. I like that. That, that was that was my go to every single time. Even with a chirp, I would just sit there and laugh and be like, "Really? That's all?" Just pretend it didn't hurt your feelings. Laugh yeah. it off. <laughs> Okay, uh, I have one more that I'm just going to ask at the second half of the show. 
Uh, so we're just going to take a quick, quick break here, uh, but we'll be right back after a quick message from the Hockey Writers. Interested in writing for the Hockey Raiders? If you have experience writing about hockey, are passionate about the sport, and are looking to take your writing to the next level, the Hockey Raiders could be the place for you. Here at THW, you will have the opportunity to hone your craft at one of the world's largest and most respected hockey publishers. You will have control over what you write, be able to seek out media credentials, and be supported by a large network of writers and editors. Plus, you'll get paid for doing it. If you're interested and want to know more about team openings and requirements, please visit the Write for THW page on the Hockey Raiders website. A link to that page is also listed in in the description all right so we'll jump back into stuff here um we always have uh the the heights and weights measurements come out and mark i know you always have a piece on these i always pound those as soon as i can because it's a lot more reliable than like twitter threads that kind of miss <laughs> stuff and jump around a little bit um there's always something interesting we can get from this. Players lie about their heights all the time <laughs> at every level. Um, but this is a chance to kind of even the playing field a little bit. Like I remember last year, Joaquin Kamel uh, was measuring all over the place height wise. I saw him as high as 5'11 at some point, but then he measured at the combine at 5.9 and a half, uh, five yeah. feet, nine and a half inches, um, which isn't crazy. But like, obviously that's a, that's the factor that NHL teams take into account. Um, so Mark, I'll ask you first, were there any, any measurements that you found pretty interesting at the, this year's draft combine? Yeah. And I, I like to look at this not only from, uh, you know, what's the true height standpoint, but also what's your true weight. And, you know, mm -hmm. when you look at whether it be elite prospects, where you look at other places, you kind of get a little bit of a baseline and you kind of think, okay, this is, you know, how are they roughly? <laughs> so there are four guys that I have down here that, I think are very interesting and they all gain like eight to 10 pounds from what's being published out on the internet. And that's exactly why we do this is mm -hmm. so that everybody has a chance to really see, okay, well, this is the most accurate as of you know when the measurements were done. So Andrew Kristall is the first one I'm going to mention. He's up to 175. Like that, that still feels lightweight, but he was listed in the one sixties. That's a, that's a, about a 10 pound jump. That's mm -hmm. significant for somebody like him who mm -hmm. has a lot of skill and could very easily go anywhere in the middle of the first round through the end of the first round. If teams see that he's gained that kind of muscle and continues to really dig into that, I personally think he's going to be a superstar already, mm -hmm. but it might give some teams that the, the you know, say you know, he's willing to put in the work. He's already gained 10. How much more can he do? How much more can he fill out? Hmm. Oliver Moore is up to 195. Again, that, you know, when I look at um, the listing that he had pre the combine, he was listed at 188. So that's seven pounds. That's hmm. seven, it could be seven pounds of muscle we're talking about. Now he's just short of 200 pounds. And you're talking somebody that is, could be a top flight center like that. Hmm. Suddenly I'm very interested in, in that sort of player. Another reason why I think hmm. that he could be that steel. Danny Nelson is somebody else that um, stood out to me in looking at. He weighed in at 212 pounds, and that's 10 pounds up from – he was listed 202 pounds. So, uh -huh. again, somebody that already has NHL size and has proven that he's willing to put in the work as well. Mm -hmm. And then another big name, last one I'll give you, David Reinbacher, up nine pounds from what's published out on the internet. He's up to 194. So that's why we look at this, because we want to get as accurate of information as possible, and literally all we do is look at the TV screen, what is published there, and then publish it for everybody to see. It's manual work, and it's we're, I think we're one of the only places that have even published this because the number it, like we're literally going all day from 7:30 in the morning until after two o'clock in the afternoon, where they're measuring guys every couple of minutes. We mm -hmm. do that because we feel like it's an important piece of information for fans to know, and it you know, could help others. You know, who knows if the teams even you know, what what they use, but we we care about accuracy, and that's why we do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I appreciate it personally, just when I'm working on my my own work, just uh, having another place to check. Like like you mentioned, Elite Prospects, they have uh, they keep that updated pretty well um, with I, I'm not sure where they pull it from, likely from um, team sites or from team sources. But also, I know when, when Central Scouting releases their rankings, they try their best to be accurate, but they can't every time they want to do like midterm 
mid-season uh, NHL Central scouting rankings. Everybody come in. We're just going to weigh you all and measure your heights. <laughs> like, no, they can't do that. So this is their chance to, but um, it's nice to have it fully updated right now. This snapshot right before the draft. Um, yeah, I'm, o- I'm always thrilled to see it. Um, Matt, I'll come to you here. Uh, are there any any measurements you saw coming out of the combine that, that caught your eye? Well, I'll do a most recent one because I just did his profile and I used the more the a most up to date height or weight, height and weight. And I didn't use elite prospects because I just had this. And that's Sawyer Minio. Uh 172 pounds listed on elite prospects. He came in at 163. So he actually was lighter. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. <laughs> I yeah. coming in, yeah. but I depending on what that loss is. For um sure could be a little more fitter, uh, that more muscle and less fat. I don't know. But uh, that was one that caught my eye just because it was such a pretty big drastic change, almost like 10 pounds or over 10 pounds less than what he was on uh, whatever's listening on Lee Prosper. That's the one I use most of the time. Uh, actually, all the time. Whenever I do these, I use that. And um, yeah, that was the one that really stood out. And then all the ones that Mark kind of uh, went through, uh, I know Crystal was one that really stood out to me as well because that's that's gain and it's definitely muscle it's not anything else um especially for a guy that size to be able to get you know get the more muscle and stand out a bit more in that because i think i'm i'm sure that's what a lot of people were concerned about is be him being slight and uh i mean elias patterson had that issue at i believe at his combine as well and uh because he was so skinny but what is he now i mean he's so so strong and that's what a lot of these undersized, not saying Elias Patterson was undersized because he is pretty tall, but, uh, you know, that muscle that's gained, especially at this point, and he'll just be able to grow. I, I'd say even more if he's able to do that now, uh, he'll be able to do that as he gets into his athletic prime, which is still like what, five years down the road for these guys. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I'd say those that Minio for sure, because I just did his profile as one that's kind of standing out to me because it was a pretty drastic change. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good example too of like uh, players and teams lie about the heights and weights maybe for weights give or take like 10 pounds in either direction and then height like two inches in either direction yeah. <laughs> you don't see it in hockey but in like the NBA players will lie about their height and say they're shorter than they are it's a whole thing Kevin Durant <laughs> always says he's like six nine but he's as tall as every person that's seven foot so like going on anyway uh they always lie all all athletes lie they they have an ideal thing in their mind and they just pretend that's where they're at uh peter i'll come to you last here uh some measurements out of this this combine are there any that that stand out to you looking back yeah um one of them is casper halton obviously not the height factor because it's still he's still listed as six three on elite prospects six three point two five um from the combine but the weight um, is, is it's very telling. Two hundred seven pounds on EP, two hundred fifteen here. So we we know how how big and how strong Halton is. Having that extra uh, muscle weight uh, can definitely help him, or not necessarily help him out, because he's already you know a, a tough and physical guy with um, his shot, his speed, and everything like that. For So for him to ha- uh, move and have that kind of strength is very great. Same thing with Anton Wahlberg, 185 pounds, um, listed as 192 as well. So you're seeing a little bit more of that increase in terms of his weight. And one other thing to overall, uh, both height and weight is Jaden Perron listed at 5'8", 157 on, you know, elite prospects, but at the combine starting to see similar to like, you know, the other prospects I mentioned how they're starting to add that weight to get more muscle and everything like that. He's 5'9", 166. So I think there's going to be a little bit more willingness to see, you know, I've I've already mentioned him, how he has that agility, that speed factor, the creativity to his game. If he's continues to add a little bit more weight and a little bit more strength to his game, I think that, you know, height factor is going to be a non-issue because of the way he's able to maneuver and hold his own during the game. Obviously, it's still a work in progress, but, you know, seeing that added, you know, added weight, added muscle this time around is definitely a good sign that he's probably trending in the right direction. Absolutely. There's, there's always so many fun ones out of here. I'm just going to quickly uh, give two things that interested me. One was Michael Parabel, 
um, measuring in at six feet, six and three quarters inches, just about six foot seven, which would make him one of the tallest <laughs> goaltenders in the history of the league, but also just one of the tallest in the league, um, which is wild because we've known that he's massive all year. And uh, if you watch him play, you know that sometimes when he's trying to get up or get down into his butterfly, there's a big space in his five hole. And it makes sense now that, you know, he's almost six foot seven. So obviously there's some unique challenges for a goalie that size, but there's also some, some distinct advantages. Um, and then Andrew Crystal, as you guys were mentioning, um, he only measured a quarter of an inch shorter than Connor Bedard and roughly 10 pounds fewer than Bedard. So that goes to show the, uh, the impact of skating at that size, especially uh, just with like, the whole um like the whole general conversation around bedard no one brings up his size a whole lot because it doesn't really matter when you skate that well shoot that well think that well crystal doesn't shoot the same as bedard but he's got a great shot he thinks the game at an incredible speed um excellent playmaker similar size but he doesn't have that same skating ability um and so that's, I think it's just, just interesting to see that they measure in so similarly physically, but that one skill is such a big differentiator. Um, I do think like you guys kind of all said, the fact that he's putting on muscle at that size is, is encouraging and, um, but packing on that weight at such a young age still, um, shows the, the dedication to improving the things he can improve, um. So I hope that helps him out a little bit. We've talked about him as someone that we hope doesn't fall too far this year, yeah. but I thought that was interesting. Um, one last question here. Uh, I'll come back to you again, Mark, with this. Is some storylines uh, coming out of this draft combine. We always learn a little something about players and in interviews or about teams and some prospects that they really fell in love with at this tournament. Like last year, it felt like as soon as the combine ended, it was like, okay, Philadelphia is taking Cutter Gauthier. There's no other option. That is the only person they're taking. Same with Arizona and Logan Cooley. Like, that feels like that happens pretty much every year. Um, is there anything like that that you're starting to hear? Anything that, uh, any prospects to watch, something like that coming out of this, Mark? What, what do you think there? Yeah, we, we could talk a long time about this, but just to limit it to just a couple <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I think the obvious one's going to be where Mishkov goes. Uh, how th- far will he end up dropping? Mm-hmm. Everybody that I talk to there, we're talking about media and other you know, just people that seem pretty well connected. Kind of hard to gauge how far he's going to fall. I, I don't think, well, he's not going to go one, probably not going to go two. Blue Jackets are already on record saying they're going to take a center, so probably not going to go there. Sharks are fourth. I'm sure Mike Greer goes down that road when he wants to make and really put a stamp on the team being the general manager there. Mm. I guess maybe Montreal was the first place that I would might consider it, but even that I think is a little bit of a stretch. But where he ends up going is going to be the big storyline. And I also think that the draft starts at three. And the reason for that is you know, Bedard is going to go to Chicago. I think everybody generally believes that. I think the overwhelming sense is that Adam Fantilli is going to go to the Ducks. It would be really shocking, at least to me, if they pivot to somebody else. But I don't think Leo Carlson to Columbus is necessarily a lock. Like, I personally yeah. think that that's where it will go. But the fact that they took out um, Fantilli, Carlson, and Will, Will Smith to dinner at the Combine suggests that they're all certainly in the running. So I think that there's going to be a decision there by the Blue Jackets. And that's going to be a big storyline that comes out of this is ultimately which way are they going to go because that's going to be a little bit of a domino effect to how the top of the first round could play out. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a really good point there. It feels like, um, well, I'm sure you know this, Mark, but it does not feel like Columbus has uh, held themselves to any public consensus in recent years. They in never the draft. do. They, they, they don't care. Right. They don't care that we think Leo Carlson is probably a little better than Will Smith. They don't care at all. Mm-hmm. They don't care what any other GM thinks. They just know who they want. Um, it does feel like Will Smith is very much in play at, at third overall. Always oh, very much in play. It, 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 they it, need a center. We expect one or the other. And where it ends up, I think they know who they want to take. 
but yeah. they're obviously not going to tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if uh, if they were a little questionable on Leo Carlson for part of the year because he played wing all year in Sweden, but then playing as Sweden's first line center at the World Championships, excellent tournament for him. Now I'll just say this real quick: if there's anybody that's going to know Carlson, it's the Blue Jackets because they had um, their staff on Team Sweden. Josef um, Bometadine was on the staff of Team Sweden and got to see mm-hmm. him up close and may have had a hand in having Carlson play top line center and you made the point about him being on the wing mm-hmm. he was directly asked by the blue jackets are you a send you project to be a center and he told him yes i am a center that was his answer so yeah they definitely pressed him on it yeah absolutely that's that's always an interesting thing to um forwards that played center at one point but got moved to the wing talking about moving back to center with nhl teams because that's a premium position still um peter i'll come to you here are there are there any players or, or storylines you're you're looking to coming out of the draft combine we're we're at the home stretch now we're like mm-hmm. two and a half weeks away from the draft just insane <laughs> yeah i i think for me and this is you know i'm not going to look too much into this because i still think he's going to go high but axel sandin pelica where is he going to go because then we heard that you know a little little tidbit from Dan Marr about Etienne Moran about being the top North American defender. And if that's the case, is the team going to take him higher than expected? Like, is he going to go ahead of ASP, Ryan Bacher, mm-hmm. Willander, Bonk? Because, you know, even like we even mentioned Tanner, Mol- Tanner Molendijk, and I'm high on all, all of them. But um, when I was in a scrum, he said that he met with the Toronto Maple Leafs last, and I'm not getting my hopes up or anything because Toronto Maple Leafs picked 28th. <laughs> but if he drops down to 28, he that is a very big drop for a dynamic defender. And I'm not just saying this because, you know, Toronto Maple Leaf writer here, but at the same time, I I like hearing that he, that the Maple Leafs, I believe I I if I recall, gotta go back and listen to the recording, but I'm almost 100 percent certain that the Maple Leafs were kind of one of the last teams that he met with. So if he's going to be in that range where it's going to be like top 10, top 15, and he continues to fall, kind of like what happened with Timothy Lilligren, although different reasons, um, falling to the Maple Leafs of 17, could Axel Sandin Pelica fall towards the end of the first round? I don't know. I I, I hope not because he should be higher. Doubt it. We saw what he was able to do at the U18s in all season. And even at the uh, World Juniors, earning the ice time and, you know, getting more minutes as the tournament went. But I, I'm curious to see because I wouldn't have him as my top or a top target because I would think he would go earlier. But now this kind of makes things interesting a little bit. Sure. I mean, it's obviously there's no predicting what's going to happen on draft day. Expect the unexpected. Um, I do feel like if in most cases I see people kind of knocking ASP, their biggest complaint is size. But it's not like he's in the Jaden Perron category, 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, he is 5 feet 11, I believe he measured in at, maybe give or take a quarter of an inch. Um, but that's not far off. That's technically undersized because, as we all know, in the NHL's mind, the difference between 5 foot 11 and 6 feet tall is like 6 inches. Um, <laughs> it's not, but that's how it seems like everyone views the difference. Um, so he is technically undersized if you consider the average NHL defenseman to be like six one, six two. But mm-hmm. he's not he's not tiny. Um can hold so his I, own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, physically as well. I mean, I believe he ended up first in the uh, bench press power fitness test, um, which is based off of 50% body weight, I believe. Um, yeah, he plays first in power there. So he's he's got yeah. the strength, which you know, what is that training? Bench press, it's training you to cross check. <laughs> uh opposing forwards in the crease i guess <laughs> so you know he can handle that but um uh i don't know he'll be he'll be interesting to see for sure um matt any any storylines any players coming out of this that you're you're following uh, in the the final stretch here well if axel sandy pelica falls past the canucks i'll be i'll be pounding the table what the hell um but <laughs> I, I I don't know. Like, and the Canucks, I mean, obviously need more than just, just uh defenseman. There's some really good forwards around that area as well. Really good centers. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, and then of course, uh, you know, where Cristal goes now, because I, I'm really interested to see where he uh, ends up after yeah. being pretty big 
storyline here after the combine. He may actually go higher than we're all ex- expecting him to fall. A uh, team may actually think, well, he's worth uh, a higher pick. So it's going to be interesting. It was going to be interesting to see where he goes anyway, but now a bit more after this weekend here. Um, yeah, though that's basically the biggest ones. And then, I mean, there was the talk. I'd say Moran being there now, all of a sudden, being a name to watch in the first round. So, uh, yeah, he's a name that I think everyone should be kind of looking at. He could go towards the end of the first or maybe even higher. We'll have to see. Um, so, yeah, some interesting things to come out of it. There's always is at least a few names that we kind of have to keep an, a closer eye on uh, as the draft goes. We weren't as much before. Yeah, totally. Uh, there's there's so much to pay attention to, and we're going to keep talking about it for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> um, but before that, we have to end today's show eventually. So I have my last <laughs> quick fire question that is a question from NHL teams. And I only know this one because of you, Mark, on Twitter. And you kept the team that said it a mystery. So I want to see if you'll you'll share that with us. <laughs> um, I want to ask you guys uh, to describe this draft year, uh, not your season, because that's not really how this works. <laughs> I'm not. This isn't a performance evaluation for you guys. Um, but uh, uh, this draft year, the 2023 NHL draft season, uh, in one emoji, describe <laughs> it in one emoji, which is so funny because as like a I'm assuming like a 40, 50 year old man, NHL AGM asking that question to 17 year olds. You're dating yourself so hard, but I just think it's really funny. Um, Personally, I'm going to go with uh, the emoji of the guy wearing like the disguise, like the fake nose and mustache and like the inspector hat, because this is my first year doing draft coverage stuff like seriously. And I just feel like I'm like sneaking my way around, like, like pretending that I'm, I'm here even though i actually am here um so i'm gonna go with that imposter syndrome maybe a little bit i'll go with that um i'm not gonna come to you first peter because i know you have uh test anxiety i guess and yeah. i don't want to <laughs> surprise you too quick um but matt if you had to describe this draft season in one emoji what do you got uh i this one came out right away it's that the one where the guy's going like this i like thinking hard like about thinking it thinking really hard I uh, oh, because yeah. there's a lot of interesting uh prospects in this draft here. Sure. So many different uh ways certain guys could go. Um uh, Mishkov being the biggest one. So I, that's my emoji is just the the thinking face like hmm, I wonder what's going to happen. But yeah. It's a, it's a good call. It's a good one. It's a good one. Uh Mark, what about yourself? If you had to describe the the draft year with one emoji, what do you got? All right, so share the emoji and then I'll share the team because by the time this comes out, I believe my piece will be out which reveals the team. That's right. Yeah. So the fire emoji is the one that I would use just because I know that the the top of the draft is obvious. The guys, you know, there, there's a bunch of guys that could be number one in most years. I actually think the depth of the first round is so, so good. I actually had someone say, you're probably not going to get a ton of personality out of this because of just how focused everyone is. And they were spot on, at least from the interviews that I had a lot of just focus and not as much personality like they have it but it's just you can tell that there's a lot of really good players so there are going to be teams middle of the first on that are going to land a really good player so that's mm-hmm. why i say fire emoji because this class is really really hot mm-hmm. and finally the team that asked everybody what to use the one emoji to describe their season Ron Francis and the Seattle. Ah. Oh man. I almost <laughs> I almost went with the squid emoji just because I really enjoy it. No, there was no reason. So I'm glad I didn't because that would have been too on brand for the Kraken. <laughs> but that feels pretty on brand for Ron Francis, who doesn't doesn't seem like he it seems like someone probably just taught him what emojis are this year. <laughs> um uh sorry ron francis hire me if you want want me to do work i'm, I'm just joking um uh, but peter i uh, hope i've given you enough time this time around I, i'm so sorry <laughs> no um, no <laughs> i actually uh, knew my emojis this time so i was actually on point oh perfect uh what do you got this this draft year in one emoji Okay, so I'm going to do one, but then give an honorable mention. I'm going to use the two eyes look in as like, <laughs> nice. you know. It's a great one. What's, yeah. what's going a, to happen? You're it's like, a classic you're, Twitter you're emoji. In. Yeah, I'm <laughs> going to use that one as like, what's going to happen? But also the one where it's like, the, 
Pokemon eye, Pokemon <laughs> oh, yeah. eye through. Nice. Like you don't know. It kind of ties in with the eyes. You don't know what to expect, and you're kind of scared, but you're nervous or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I'm gonna go with the eyes first, and then the uh, you know poking through your fingers <laughs> as the honorable mention. Nice. Those are great ones. Great ones. Good work. Good work. Um, okay, we're gonna quickly, quickly wrap up the show here. Uh, the same way we like to do every week uh, with our prospects of the week. Um, it's kind of hard to come up with these at this point because no one's playing and we just talked about everyone we're excited about. But this is just a, a platform to talk about someone you're excited about again. It can be someone you already talked about. Um, I'm going with Tom Volander, who's someone I already talked about. Um, <laughs> but I've just been anyone who's watched this show over the last month and a half knows I've been really high on him. Um, and I really expect NHL teams to be high on him just based off his play. However, um, after interviews and seeing some of the testing and seeing his his official measurements, I believe he's right around six one, six one and a half maybe. Um, I feel like I I feel even more like solidified that he is no doubt a top sixteen pick, and I'd be shocked genuinely if he makes it past Buffalo at thirteen. There's enough teams earlier than that that are in desperate need of a right shot D, and I just feel like he's probably going in that range. Uh, he might not, but I feel like he definitely did himself favors at this this combine as well as the the U18s where he was excellent. Um, next on here, Peter, I'll come to you. Who's your your prospect of the week this week? I am going to say Tanner Molendijk. Um, I I've talked about him quite a bit on the show, but also in the Braden Jaeger scrum, someone asked, uh, you know, if there is one player that should be kept an eye on in this draft class, who would it be? And uh, his answer was Tanner Molendijk because of the fact that he's so smart, quick, good outlet passer, and I think he's one of the more underrated defensemen in this draft class because. He's so quiet. And even when I talk to him, I ask him, you seem to have like a lot of poise and confidence that like you don't panic under pressure. He says that's how he operates. He operates with a laid back mentality off the ice and how he operates off the ice is how he operates on the ice. So I, I think the fact that he has that going for him, the two way game, the fact that he's able to maintain that confidence and composure is a good sign. And I think teams are going to should take note on that because that's really hard to find in a young defender. That's a great one. Molendijk is is a big player to watch the next couple of years. His skating is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, I'll come to you here. Do you have a, a prospect of the week for us? I do. So I talked about Oliver Moore earlier, so I won't use him again. But I'll talk about another center that I don't think is quite getting enough attention. And I'm, I'm not going to scare anybody with the third pick. I said what I said earlier about Carl Center Smith. But if there's a guy, and you know the Blue Jackets' tendency of wanting to to surprise everybody because they do their own thing. Like yeah. if they were to somehow <laughs> pivot away from the expected, Nate Danielson is the guy. And that's going to be my prospect. That's my guy. <laughs> yeah. But, Logan's you know, like, got the size, you know, not really getting enough attention, kind of getting lost with all the top talk at the top there. But that's another guy that I think a lot of teams are going to be very interested in. If somebody mm -hmm. a little bit later past the, the top of the first round here lands him, they're going to feel really good leaving Nashville. Absolutely. I'm a huge Danielson guy. I think he might be a top 10 pick on talent and just genuinely on draft day. Uh, closing us off here, Matt, who's your prospect of the week this week? Well, I'm going to shout out a guy that could have been drafted, probably should have been drafted last season, and that's uh, Coach Adelic. Uh, Sudbury Wolves, I, like I said, he was ranked, I believe, third, well, I don't know, third, fourth round there. I know his profile, whoever did, I can't remember who did his profile last, but I looked at it before and they were projecting him third, fourth round, obviously didn't get drafted. Uh, this season had a bit more points, 52 points in 46 games, 22 goals up from his 17 from his draft was well, first eligible draft year. Uh, now coming in as an overager, you know, I think he probably should be drafted. I uh, should have been drafted last season, probably will be drafted this season. Uh, this year, uh, very high motor, very competitive. I think you could end up being a, that good third, fourth line player in, in the NHL. So um, shout out to Coach Adelic. I'm hoping he gets drafted just like Thomas Millich, all these overagers. And there's a lot of overagers this this year. Just because of the COVID year, there's, there's still those guys kind of trickling through that uh, probably weren't drafted because of that. So I'm uh, yeah. just going to shout him out to give him a bit of a 
bit of a boost <laughs> going into yeah, the draft. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Awesome. Well, th- those are great there, Matt. Thank you. Um, that does it for us this week. Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Prospect Corner. Make sure you subscribe to the Hockey Writers YouTube channel to make sure you catch all our new episodes. And also make sure you check out our site, thehockeywriters.com, for tons of 2023 draft coverage over the last couple of weeks leading up to the draft. Thank you, Peter and Matt, as always. Thank you, Mark, for stopping by. And thank you all for watching this week's episode of Prospect Corner. We'll see you next time.